Ready to understand the treatment differences between STEMIs and NSTEMIs? Perfect, because today we're gonna to talk about the checklist every ER nurse goes through, at least mentally, when taking care of the heart attack patient. So if you're a new nurse or just new to the ER, then this video is for you. So be sure to watch till the end so you're prepared for your next shift. So the number one goal of STEMI treatment is to open up the occluded coronary artery as soon as possible. And this is because by the time that you have ST elevation on an EKG, the coronary artery is completely occluded and there's a good portion of the heart muscle that's already dead. We call it full thickness damage because now one wall of the heart has died. And if we don't get that coronary artery opened up, then more of the heart will die. And once enough of the heart dies, then the heart won't pump anymore. And well, that's cardiac arrest, folks. So let's get that coronary artery opened up. So let's talk about the STEMI checklist for PCI. So if you're at a hospital that has a 24 seven cath lab and on-call cath lab staff, then the goal is first medical contact to balloon time, 90 minutes. Now, if you're at a critical access hospital and you have to transfer to a PCI center, then the goal is first medical contact to balloon time is 120 minutes. So get your EKG, and this should be done within 10 minutes per American Heart Association guidelines. Now, even if the patient is coming in EMS and the STEMI was activated in the field, we will still get another EKG once the patient gets to the ER in order to confirm that it is a STEMI. Put your patient on the crash card and make sure that if your hospital has them, you use radio translucent pads. That way when we get a stat chest x-ray, the x-ray can see the heart through the crash cart pads. So give your aspirin and then insert two large IVs, a 20 gauge or greater in the AC. And if you can't get them in the AC, at least try not to put them in the wrist because the cath lab staff can use radial arteries as well as femoral. So make sure you get your labs and you send them, but hopefully the patient will already be in the cath lab by the time that you get those results back. Make sure you follow Mona as well. Assess your airway and your oxygenation. Is the patient's oxygen sat less than 90? Do they need oxygen? Give nitro and morphine as it's ordered and appropriate. Chest x-ray will come to the room and they will shoot a portable chest x-ray. Also on your STEMI patients, you also might give them Plavix. And this can be as high of a dose as 600 milligrams sometimes. And the patient will also get heparin, but it's usually just a bolus and not a drip because the patient's gonna be going for emergent PCI. And then get your informed consent signed once the cardiologist has discussed the risks and benefits with the patient. Next, make sure that your patient is in a gown and completely undressed underneath. And yes, that includes underclothes. And then if you have the time, try to make sure that the hair in the groin site is either clipped or shaved because that will help the cardiologist visualize the femoral insertion site should they choose to use it. So what if we're in a hospital that doesn't have a 24 seven cath lab or on-call cath lab staff? How are we gonna get this blood vessel opened up? Well, that's a great question. So we usually use fibrinolytics in that case. Those are medications that help break up the clot that's occluding the coronary artery. And the favorite fibrinolytic for STEMIs is tenecteplase or TNKs for short. And the time goal here is door to needle or fibrinolytic therapy time of 30 minutes. So with both fibrinolytic therapy and PCI, there are some certain checklist steps in common. You get your EKG within 10 minutes. You put your patient on the crash cart. You give them oxygen if they need it. Give them aspirin. Insert two large bore IVs, again, in the AC. Because even if the patient isn't going to the cath lab right now, they will go to the cath lab eventually. Send your labs. 
X-ray will come to the room and shoot a chest X-ray. You can give nitro as long as it's not a right-sided MI, and you can give morphine. Then you'll give your Plavix and your heparin bolus. Next, the provider is going to go through a fibrinolytic therapy contraindication checklist, and this is to assess the patient for any condition or history of conditions that would place the patient at increased risk for bleeding if they receive fibrinolytic therapy. And I'm not going to go through all of these conditions because each of your facilities should have a checklist that lists these conditions, but here are a few of the big ones. Any history of intracranial hemorrhage, any active internal bleeding, but this excludes menstruation in women, a suspected aortic dissection or suspected pericarditis, and any known intracranial neoplasm. So if you are going to give fibrinolytic therapy, then you still need to make sure that you get an informed consent because this medication is risky and the patient really needs to understand the risks and benefits. And then you mix it and it's a dosage based on weight and you push it over five seconds and that's it. And then you really need to get the patient to a facility that has a cath lab. And the goal is that we transfer patients to a PCI center right after receiving fibrinolytic therapy and they should get cathed within 24 hours. And I'll put some resource links in the description below, like how to mix and administer TNKs and other research studies. So before we go on, I just kind of want to talk about why we actually prefer PCI to fibrinolytic therapy. So the first reason is that because with fibrinolytics, there is a major risk of bleeding. Secondly, only about 40 to 50% of patients that receive these drugs will actually achieve complete reperfusion. And then thirdly, about 5% of patients that have initial successful reperfusion will reinfarct. And that's why we really need to get them to a PCI center for definitive treatment. So an end STEMI isn't as bad as a STEMI. With an end STEMI, there's still plaque and a clot in a coronary artery that's occluding blood flow, but some blood is still getting around that clot and some blood is still able to perfuse the heart muscle. So the whole thickness of the heart muscle wall has not died like it has in a STEMI. Some of the heart muscle has died, which is why we call it a myocardial infarction, infarction meaning death, but it's not the whole thickness. We still need to get that clot broken down and that plaque cleaned out, but this isn't as emergent as a STEMI. So you'll still do all your normal chest pain stuff. Get your EKG, put the patient on the cardiac monitor, get your IV, send your labs, get your chest x-ray, follow Mona. You'll give the patient a heparin bolus and it's usually followed by heparin drip. And heparin won't break down the clot in the same way that TNKs or fibrinolytics will, but it will help prevent that clot from getting any bigger. You might also put these patients on a nitro drip, as long as the MI is not right-sided, to keep the arteries vasodilated. Or you might give them transdermal or nitro paste at scheduled times throughout the day. And then the definitive treatment for an end STEMI is still going to the cath lab and getting coronary angiography and balloon angioplasty. It's just not as emergent as a STEMI. So you'll admit these patients and then they'll go to the cath lab at some point later, or if it's nighttime, they'll go to the cath lab later the next day in the morning. So you need to be aware of when the patient's gonna be going to the cath lab. That way you keep them NPO at an appropriate time. Welcome back. Thanks for watching till the end. If you got value out of this video, then tap the like button. And if you missed my ER chest pain video, then click or tap the screen over here. And if you never want to miss another one of my videos, then tap subscribe. Otherwise, stay safe and I'll see you guys next time.